Yeah, there we go. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, we are here live. Uh, this is the XYZ uh, live broadcast for Australia Day. Um, we were originally going to do this on the XYZ's channel, but we had some technical difficulties and couldn't get the, the stream to start there for some reason. Uh, so we're doing it on, on my channel. So David, David Hiscox and David Hilton, uh, welcome to my channel. Uh, uh, Hilton, take it away. You are the MC. Uh, <laughs> course, yes. Um, yeah, thanks very much, Matty. Oh, thanks, for, uh, I think, thanks for hosting us. It's uh, very much appreciated. Um, well, uh, welcome to Frequently Asked Questions on XYZ Television. This is uh, Frequently Asked Questions Live. Uh, and today we're talking about Australia Day. Um, have you guys had a good Australia Day? Have you, have you had a barbecue? No, I didn't do anything Australian today. I, I, today I've eaten both bacon and kangaroo on the same day. I'm, I'm quite happy about that. Um, have you been having a barbecue, Maddie, or have you just? Oh, I, I worked today, so um, my my <laughs> Australia day has been un Australian. Yeah, I know, very. But uh, a few passengers were um, were happy to have an Australian Uber driver on Australia day. They they got a kick out of that one. <laughs> he does come out come out of the woodwork, yeah. We're, we're becoming like those endangered species that yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, um, it is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the other day on uh on Channel Ten I saw on the project, um uh, Lisa Wilkinson was um talking about how she's coming to the project and she said that um the great thing about the project is that you're gonna feel uh well informed. And uh, here on the X, I said, there's none of that nonsense, none of that rubbish about feelings. So I'm going to ask a direct question to uh, to you, David Hilton. What does Australia Day mean? Honestly, yeah. um, it's 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 a bit of sift that bullshit, to be honest. Um, look, I, I I think it's good that we celebrate that we have, where we remember or, or we think about all of those sorts of identity issues and things like that. But but ultimately, like Australia is never really such a big deal, you know, going back fifty or hundred years ago, um, because when you've got a really strong and clear identity, you don't need to have a day where you celebrate it. Do you know what I mean? So um, I know it's a bit a bit odd because you know, I sort of uh, I write a lot about nationalism and that type of thing. And look, I think it's good that we support Australia Day because it's it's become a key battleground with the left, you know. But but to be honest, it's it's not a big day um, for me. It never really was. It, like it was a day where we go over a mate's place, we play cricket and stuff like that. But it was never fetishized and it was never made into some sort of symbol. Whereas now it's because of the left's attack on so much of our culture and our identity, it's now taken on all of that sort of civic nationalist uh, symbolism, which, like, we accept that. We have to fight it. But but to be perfectly frank with you, on a personal level, it's not such a big day. It's not a big deal. I'll, I'll probably pay more attention to Anzac Day. Yeah. Um, um, than to Australia Day. Um, yeah, so, look, I'm not trying to... I wouldn't want anyone to think I'm, like, counter-signalling or anything like that. I'm just saying that... Um, as far as uh, nationalism goes, um, if you shouldn't need a day to sort of celebrate who you are, um, if you already know who you are, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Um, there could be a counter that, that um, a counter to that. That um, until recently, uh, we have just been very secure in our identity, and it's. Uh, like the left, they've been building up uh, gradually over time, but they have really, like, it's like all the chess pieces are in position to attack now. And they, they have their queen, they have their, all their rooks, all their bishops, like, lined up on Australia Day. And we're like, whoa, hang on, we've got to go up and defend it. I know what you mean, because for yeah, me, Australia yeah. Day, um, as, a, as a piano teacher, like, I'm getting ready just to go back to um, to teaching, and I've had a number of like uh, family birthdays already, and there's been Christmas. I've seen heaps of my family. It's been beautiful. It's been a beautiful summer. Um, Australia Day wasn't always such a big deal, but it goes to the heart of who we are because it's when uh, the well, it, it celebrates when the British landed in and basically set up the colony uh, in Sydney Harbour. Um, 
And the left are attacking that because, like, if they attack why we're here, they can fundamentally change the nature of the whole country. I tend to agree with sort of both of you in a in a similar way in that I, I, I agree that, yeah, if, if we were secure in ourselves, we wouldn't really need a national day to celebrate. I mean, still, it's still Australia's birthday, so we, we still deserve a holiday for it regardless. But, I mean, I've really only... It's only really been since the left started the assault on Australia Day and 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 made it the thing to call it Invasion Day. That's the that's when I really sort of stood up and said, "Hey, hey, wait a minute! It's not Invasion Day; it's Australia Day." And I think people just people have started getting their back up a lot. And I think this year especially, a lot of people a lot of people are getting their back up about it. And I mean, just just today, speaking to a couple of people and, and just. Just talking about the flogs down on Spring Street, uh, <laughs> protesting and calling it, you know, for change the date day, and you know, the, the people, people sort of look at that and think, just you're idiots. Like, stop, stop having a go at Australia. Like, stop complaining about, stop complaining about Australia and what Australia is. I mean, one of the things that I've been sort of asking people is, all right, you you don't think, you know, you don't like white settlement. How about? you go and live as a hunter gatherer for a year, like no bit like a proper hunter gatherer, you know? So no electricity, no plastics, no phone, no, no medicine, you know, no, no medicine at all. No, nothing for a whole year. Um, and then if you manage to survive, which is unlikely, come back to us in a year and let us know which kind of life you'd actually prefer, whether, you know, starving for, you know, hunter gatherers spend days without eating, uh, and they have to go and find all their food, and they could die at any moment because you know they could they could get an infection, they could not be able to find enough food to live, uh, they could not be able to find water. So I mean, yeah, look, we came here and some bad stuff happened, but in the West is objectively better than a hunter gatherer lifestyle. That's why we have developed civilization. That was the whole point to make life now better than what it was when we were going around hunting kangaroos and um and throwing throwing boomerangs at at, at wombats or whatever they did well, bill Whittle actually has a, sorry david uh, bill Whittle has a theory that it would only take three and a half days uh to three and a half days in the wilderness of having to fend for yourself feed yourself hunt your own food keep yourself warm and only take three and a half days to basically turn anybody around to go you know what i love civilization i love the free market it's great <laughs> Sorry, david. <laughs> david you were saying oh uh, when we'll miss it when we're gone um and, yeah. and by the time we we start to get the consequences of this lunacy uh it'll be too late to turn it back in my view like um you know what if once you started to burn your house down um you know, it's only when you, you see it actually disappear that you realise, oh, hey, maybe that wasn't maybe that wasn't the best thing to do. You know, to to virtue signal somehow to my neighbours by burning my own house down, which is which is, that's what the left is doing. It's it's just so so crazy. I, I saw uh, some photos, and I think it was what you're talking about, Maddie, of um, thousands of people marching through Melbourne, um, talking about talking about it, Invasion Day, and um, you know, it, like you, you have to just. Um, you really have to sit back and marvel at the insanity of it. Like, how can you be that? How can you become that crazy? Like, like what's going on with these people to motivate them to go out into the street to to make noise to try and destroy this national holiday? Which, if they if they do push this through, when when Labor gets in, if they if they do this, if they try and change the date, I really think we're getting towards civil war territory. Yeah. And because you don't, you don't fuck with that stuff. Like the, 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 the bedrock of people's identity, you don't go after that stuff or you get something like the US civil war. And um, the left, man, they are not going to stop. And it really does concern me where this is headed because uh, they are getting more and more hysterical and, and like you were saying, Maddie, a lot of people who wouldn't be politically engaged usually are seeing that and they're like, hang on, you people are for real. Like, you what? And so those two camps, mate, that's, that's not good for the country at all. No, it's not, it's not good at all. Uh, it, it, ultimately, it's – see, here's, this is one point, that one thing I wanted to bring out that I saw today. Now, a lot of – 
you know, you hear these people saying, change the date, change the date, change the date. But ultimately, it's just a Band-Aid on what they really, it's just it's sort of a cover for what they really want. There was someone, I think it was either the one at Spring Street or the one in Sydney where they did say, no, we don't want to change the date, we just want to abolish Australia, Jay, which I think is actually a little bit more honest than the change the date, um, the change the date movement. Because, I mean, changing the date, it's not about, you know, oh, 26, that's so offensive. The whole the reason they're upset is Western civilization. That's their that's their big thing. So it's not about, oh, we want to change the date to be a little bit more sensitive. It's about let's just get rid of Australia Day so that and, and tell Australians that you should be ashamed of of who you are. And it's really sort of implying that oh that white people are somehow have somehow been a disaster. Uh, every in every single way, which is objectively untrue. I mean, you saw in my, my Stan Grant video that Aboriginal lifespans have doubled over, <laughs> they've d literally doubled. They've gone from about, you know, about 30, 30 to 40 years to, I think for males, it was uh, 68 years and for females, it was 73 years. So that's, that, that's an objectively longer life. And I know they've got like the alcoholism and, and all that kind of thing, which is, which is certainly a problem but when you look at all the there's still a lot of success as well like you know a lot of people who i mean this is what annoys me about guys like stan grant is first of all he's half white and he's saying oh i'm like it's my people and what about your other the other half of your people mate you're <laughs> what about what about the, the white half of uh, of who you are so he and he's obviously done well if he's he's saying oh i'm an aboriginal person but he's still living a much better life than he would have if somehow he'd been born before Europeans had come. I mean, he's living, he's comfortable, he's wearing a suit, he's wealthy, he gets to travel around and, and give, give dumb speeches telling people how bad Australia is. I mean, his life is objectively better than it would have been had white people not come to Australia. And another thing, they always, they always assume that if the British people hadn't come, then no one else would, which is completely <laughs> untrue. It's, it's that, completely untrue. I mean, if you had a choice, if you had to sit down and you say, okay, we're going to be colonised by English, uh, some other European country, uh, China, Japan or Islam, which one would you pick? I mean, come on, it's a, it's a no-brainer. You would pick the British Empire 100% of the time because despite all the things that they did which weren't good, they, were, they are objectively better than any of the other options would have been anyway. I find it quite uh, telling. Yeah, but you, see, oh, you go, David. I find it quite telling that uh, the empires that were in uh, Indonesia, um, in Southeast Asia, China, Japan, um, and uh, the Muslims as well, who had trading spots all the way through the Malacca Straits, all the way around, that um, they were wanting what we got like centuries beforehand they had this big continent there for for centuries and they never did anything with it it was the british who came from the other side of the world they came from the other side of the world as part of the europeans having to find another way around to this to the to india and china because the um muslims had taken uh, constantinople and cut off the uh the spice road so they had to find another way around they found australia it's mostly desert, but they were like, hey, let's make a colony of it. And they turned it into one of the uh, greatest countries in the world. I think that's quite telling that, like, they just found it by accident and they made it a great country. It was always there. And, the, and like, the people in the proximity always knew it was there as well, but they didn't do anything with it. Mm. Yeah, and yeah. isn't it funny when these, like, the, these grievance mongers turn around and say, oh, well, you know, James Cook didn't really discover Australia, people were already here. But at the same time, like, if I go out and I find a new restaurant that I think is really great, I say, oh, I discovered a great new restaurant. I don't think, <laughs> I don't assume that I'm the first person to have ever found that restaurant. I mean, I discovered it and I just, I was the first, this is the first time I found it. So I still technically discovered it. Uh, but, you know, it's just, it, like all these these silly little games that that these lefties play. Uh, and ultimately, it's it's like Jordan Peterson says, it's just power games. It's all power games. All the, their, entire, their entire worldview is based on, well, there's someone at the top and there's someone at the bottom and we just want to be at the top. I mean, that's, that's such I a simplistic way just, of looking at the world. I, I think just like what happened with Maoism and... Fall of the Soviet Union. 
like you'll see uh, an intensification of the cult just before it all falls apart. It just seems to be part of the pattern. Like with the French Revolution, when the Jacobins took over, there was this period where you had the revolutionaries themselves running the country and they were complete lunatics. And they became more and more utopian, more and more murderous until the, there's a crisis and then it all falls away. And later people look back and they're like, how the hell did we ever put up with that? You know, how did we ever believe any of that stuff? It's the mm. same with Maoism. Um, the Cultural Revolution happened in the late 60s and uh, Mao uh, died in the mid-70s. And so that late, um, that late 60s uh, period was the most intense period of persecution and just ideological craziness. I think we're seeing the same thing with Western Marxism. So the, the, the smarter ones kind of know that it's not working out. Reality is giving the data back from this experiment and none of it has worked out. Women are worse off. Aborigines are worse off. Um, white men are just not buying into it anymore. You're jumping off this bandwagon because there's nothing in it for them. Um, you know, everything's falling apart from this utopian experiment. And so I think these people are having a bit of a crisis of faith and they're becoming more intense and I guess the question is how far because these people control the levers of power still now you've got um, lunatics like um, Tanya Plibersek um, who's just about to become a minister again once the, the once Labor gets in you know she could well become a prime minister like they, these people really control the place how, how far are they going to go um, before they're finally just superannuated and put out to pasture and the grown-ups take over again I think it, I'm kind of hoping that the grown-ups are about to take over. I think, the, like, like we talked about before, there's just there there is beginning to be a bit of a pushback, and where before people might not have been willing to stand up and and call, you know, call people out on their nonsense for fear of maybe being ostracised or or whatever. I think people are sort of realizing that wait a minute, I can still I can say what I want, and as long as I believe what I want, and I'm as long as I'm not hurting anyone, then if they get upset about that, then that's their problem and not mine. I'm entitled to my opinion. I think a lot of people are sort of realizing this, and and because of the internet, we're no longer like we no longer need to be browbeaten by the lefties in the media who just stir up all this hatred of, of Western civilization and 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 this sensationalism as well. Like I think people are sort of slowly realizing that the media are. Are full of it now if, before we uh before we move on to the next bit i just wanted to give a couple of people have said something in the chat so i mean I thought we'd just give you you guys maybe a chance to respond to one of these comments uh so venom eagle said i just i just got back from station work in remote south australia i would highly recommend it for other young aussies who have grown up in the in the city so any either of you want to say anything about that little comment yeah, good on mate. The more you can get out and um, see how other people in the country really live, um, uh, the more you'll be able to get a grip on reality and not take out your views from the media and stuff. So, yeah, top notch going out and doing that. Yep, and uh, we got yeah. another one. I really from... like the idea of that too. Yeah. I really like the idea of that too. Did you see on the news today, Maddie? Um, or maybe it was yesterday, there was news about um, the milk from cows has been a little bit flat and so it's been affecting people's coffees. That was news here uh, in Melbourne. That was news? What? That was news, yes. That's ridiculous. Yeah, so I, That's not newsworthy. Anyone in Melbourne drinks cow's milk, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, so, someone in Melbourne drink, drink cool cream on. milk. <laughs> I, think it's bad. I, I did do a, uh, I did do a little piss take of that. I made a, I made a little joke uh, article about how Melbourne tore itself apart when this, when there was a bit of a soy. I remember uh, that uh, crisis. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> they started, they started it's, feeling masculine. Yeah, we, um, we have a, we have a uh, category X Y Z predicts the future. <laughs> well, uh, did you read the article that I sent you today? I, I wrote a very special oh, yeah, no. bonus one. Did you read that? You see that? Okay. I won't spoil it for you, but Richard Dinatali, this is what gives me a great deal of confidence. Richard Dinatali has come out and got his picture of Change the Date, got the Aboriginal flag behind him in his Change the Date t-shirt and <laughs> I'm on Wuju Rindi or whatever the hell land it was. And every comment bar maybe like two was just ripping into him, just calling him out. And I wrote awesome. an article. I was just sort of taking like sort of five, five or six of the best ones, and, and written written an article about it. And it's so they really, yeah, I really started enjoying. Yeah, I, don't, I, don't, 
I see this lot that um, when the when the leftards post this virtue signaling crap on social media, let, I, I just see like a whole bunch of um, literally Hitler uh, style comments. But I don't know if the algorithm bots are showing me my own little echo chamber or is that really what's what's going on in the broader society but i'm definitely seeing it a lot more and i don't know if it's that um we're being put more into an echo chamber and so i just happen to be seeing more of that stuff or is the rebellion really the size that it is but um yeah I, when i see um the green senators or the journalists um putting up stuff uh, unless they get there first they just get savaged uh, at least yeah, when I don't, I don't think when it comes to comments like that. So when it comes to people commenting on Twitter, I don't think it filters out for your bubble because there was like 20, I saw twenty six comments and I sort of went through them and it would have been about twenty six, you know, 25, 30 comments. So I don't think they filter out the comments. I think what they're filtering is more the people, like the people that you're following. Because I mean, how could they? How could they filter out? Uh, I mean, maybe they could look at who the, these people are liking and say, you're only going to get those comments, but I don't know. I'm not a tech geek, so maybe maybe I'm wrong, but I can't see how they'd be filtering out comments to put you in an echo chamber. I don't think that would be kind of counterproductive too. It would make the, it would make the platform a bit boring. Uh, also, so I just want there's another couple of comments here that yeah. uh, that we can, uh, yeah, that I wanted to maybe Maybe we'll ask Hiscox can answer this one. So... Uh, Killer three thousand AD said, uh, "Changing the date won't make them happy. They'll just complain." Next, that it's not a celebration day, but a day of mourning, and use it to browbeat whites. Yes, I agree totally. I actually, actually saw sorry, something. Yeah. Somebody uh, actually um, said, um, "Australia, uh, like, change the date is only the start." Yeah, it's, it, it really is only the start. They want to change the whole identity of Australia. They want to change, um, well, yeah, go, exactly. going after Australia. To, there's still, there's two more comments at the moment. That we get, there's two more that we'll do, but yeah. Yeah, um, Anzac yeah, Day is wonderful, uh, Australia does. Yeah, Anzac Day will be next, and then it'll um, be uh, making uh, our public uh, leaders celebrate Ramadan and Chinese New Year. It, it, like, that's where it's headed. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I think it's it's you know it's the dripping water. It's just one step. One, you give them one, they take another. You give them one, they take another. You just what you just can't you can't give them any ground. You just got to say, this far, no further. The line must be drawn here. Yeah. You shall not pass. <laughs> you shall not pass. And then you get <laughs> someone like you know Stefan mulling you in a robe and going, oh, fighting fighting the left rog. <laughs> and mockery. Memeing thing is just destroying them because when you're dealing with with a cult, I think the best thing you do is ask at it. You know, when you're dealing with this type of mentality, so that's working really well. We just need to keep on with that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so another another one. We just I actually missed this comment here. So Mr. Anti Far Left said. Um, Anzac Day is the sacred day, but sometime over the next 15 years, the hard left will come after that also. Put money on it. Now, I agreed to that. I agree that they'll, they, they could try, but I um, I think that would be a very big mistake on their behalf. <laughs> so, hey, you saw what happened to Yasmin Adele, whatever her name was. I think if, if the left ever went after Anzac Day, they would basically be committing Harry Curry. They'd be they'd be destroying their own credibility. No one, everyone would just be like, whoa, we thought you were bad before. Now you, you, you've you destroyed, you, you know, you're killing yourselves. Go away. Anzac Day is sacred. That's why we need to encourage them to do it. Uh, acceleration. It. I'm, a fan, I'm a fan of accelerationism. So I actually tweeted just today. I said, um, project, a uh, project Anzac Day Accelerate begins now. So I'm going to try and troll as much as I can and plant that meme out there because we want them to go for as I, like I'm of the view now that um things are so bad that we want them to go for Anzac Day as quickly as possible, so that they activate the normies as quickly as possible and we can salvage as much as we can. But their, their slow and steady uh, Fabian socialist approach has been working really well for them. Mm. So we, we don't want to let them do that. We want the crazies, the full-on purple-haired blind whale hysterical types to take over and, um, and, and just pedal to the metal, please, lefties, because that's what's going to – you're going to undo yourselves ultimately. 
Well, that's what uh, Lucas Rosses was talking about when he was discussing the uh, Spanish Civil War. Basically, the left just pushed way too far, too hard, and they created the reaction. Um, the same thing happened in Chile in 1973. Whenever the left pushed too hard, uh, the conservatives, the ordinary people just pushed back um, and they support. I think um, it depends. Who are going to go after it. Sorry, I interrupted yeah. you. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think it, it depends it on the um, on the country. We're lucky in that we've got a relatively high IQ country with a a long a long tradition of um, of individual individualism and and decentralization of power. And I think it come it comes from all the way back from Christianity. I think I think the fact that we're like Western civilization built on those Christian values with same probably I mean. You see socialism sort of taking hold in South America. I think a lot of it has to do with uh, maybe relatively low IQs. Um, now, especially now that we know socialism is a complete dud, and all you have to do, you still see, you still see socialists coming out saying, "Oh no, you know, Venezuela's state capitalism, USSR was really capitalism. It wasn't, you know, we've never tried socialism." But the, the, these people, and it's it's obvious that they're lunatics to anyone with more than half a brain. I'm um, just going on something, uh, just sort of the counter to that, like the negative side of this, um, but, but also agreeing with David here. Uh, we need to accelerate it. And in a way, I do hope the left accelerates it because um, if the demographics of Australia continue the way that they are, yeah. I don't know um, if the pushback yeah. on Australia Day and Anzac Day is going to be as big in, say, 10, 20 years' time as it would be in the next five. Um, because Australia, like you look at um, central Melbourne, it's uh, it, it's less than fifty percent um, Aussie, basically, um, and like the, the rest of the cities are going like that, and more and more people are coming in from other countries, and they don't uh, see British heritage the same way that we do. Um, they haven't had our decades of schooling, um, and even like they they see heritage differently to say even like the Italians and the Greeks and a lot of the people who came from Europe after World War Two, um, and so it, like because I've had conversations with these people and they say well we're changing Australia they're open about it and they're brash and they see it as their right to do that so um, it's it's actually vital that something a, a really big pushback happens this decade this in this coming decade yeah yeah can't be on xenophobia and hatred. Absolutely. Like, <laughs> it's not us. That's not us. And we, we wouldn't need to go down that road. But I, I, I do think we're going to see public figures uh, start to really make the case of that more of that ethnic nationalist um, type of message, David. And, you know, and it's not just or anything like that. It's because um, I see a lot on social media. There's, um, for example, there's a, a columnist who I have great respect for, Rita Penar. She's down in Melbourne here. Um, you know, she's a civic nationalist sort of type. Um, and she, she likes Western values because she experienced the oppression of Iran before. But she'll say things like, oh, you know, we don't need to stop immigration. We just need the right kind of immigrants. Or um, you'll, see, you'll see other um, Asian, uh, based Asians, you know, the sort of um, pro-Western civilization, pro-Western values, pro-Australian values types. And, um, you know, that, they'll say, oh, look, Australia Day doesn't really mean anything, but, you know, we should probably keep it. And you're not going to treasure it unless you grew up with them. That's really as part of your culture. There's, there's, you can't fake that. And that's not a statement of hate or exclusion or anything like that. It's just the way it is. So if we want to keep the culture as we know it, we're going to have to do that. Yeah, I, I mean, I do tend to agree, but, again, I I don't know if it's maybe just me that I noticed it a lot more this year, or whether it's you know, I, you know whether it it's, it is a, a phenomenon that's recent. But there's definitely been a lot more people talking about Australia Day and how much they value it this year, as far as I can tell. But that could be that you know, oh, you buy a Corolla and you see Corollas all over the place. So it could be that I'm valuing it a bit more, or it could be that more people are valuing it again. And again, there was a there was also a poll done recently. You know how there was that poll, all oh, half people don't actually care what the date is. And that was trotted out through the media, all over the media as, oh, proof that it's okay to change the date. 
like three days later, the IPA came, did a poll that asked the specific question, should we change the date? And it was like 80% no. So, yeah, that, uh, and it got no run in the media. It was in the Herald Sun and that's it. So obviously Fairfax and ABC uh, thought the, the soy shortage or the, the milk shortage was, was newsworthy, but a poll that didn't get, that confirmed that they were wrong um, was somehow, somehow missed, missed cut. I, I'm not, Exactly sure how how that uh, how that happened. Maybe they just accidentally missed it. Kind of like the uh, the Twitter censure, the, 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 kind of like um, the Project Veritas revelations that haven't appeared in Australian media at all, even though it's probably one of the biggest stories of the year. Uh, I was actually what, what revelations. Almost, you go down the list. Sorry, you go down the list. Yeah, um, the, yeah. The normies, the normies are now so low info. I'm wondering how they function. Like, what do the normies talk about if Las Vegas shooting comes up? Like, they don't even have a narrative anymore given to them by their bullshit media. So, yeah, the um, the credulity required to buy into the mainstream media now it must be taxing all of them because they're just so information poor. You know? Yeah. Well, the the more people, the more people that call out the media on on their bull the more people sort of turn around and think like, I think people, a lot of people instinctively know that the media is lying to them. Like I always knew that the media was lying to me when I was younger. And I think maybe some people might've been on the fence, but there are a lot of people who sort of thought, Oh, they're lying to me. Maybe they are lying to me. Maybe they're not. But then in, when they get a counter view and then someone actually points it out to them and says, they're lying to you right there. Have a look at it. This is how they're lying to you. It's like saying, Oh, the emperor has no clothes. And all of a sudden, wait a minute. Yeah. The emperor has no clothes. They are lying to you us they're lying to all of us and it's that aha moment like and i get comments on my channel i got a couple of comments on my channel saying oh i used to be left and now i'm now i'm sort of leaning to the right and and that, a lot of that is you know i would imagine a lot of that is because of the internet and the fact that there is all that extra information out there mm. and it's easy to poke holes in a left-wing argument because they're so full of holes it's like you don't even need to try you could look at a standard left-wing article or left-wing propaganda video and you could you, you could write a hundred response videos to it and every single one would have would be entertaining a, a lot of the time just because there are so many holes in their logic and it's so obvious when it's when, when all you have to do is look at it and you go all right there's a hole there's a hole that doesn't make sense that doesn't make sense that doesn't make sense all right i'm just gonna let people know exactly how it is and you see a lot of people going oh yeah Never thought of it like that or, or yeah, I always knew that, but, you know, thank you for pointing it out. I really appreciate that you pointed it out and it's good that someone else actually seeing the same thing as me. So it's, it, it, I think it's really good. Like you talk about the pushback. I think the pushback is coming in sites like XYZ and, um, and Blair Cottrell as well. Like Blair Cottrell is just, you know, He's this guy's steaming to the top. This guy, and he gets called a Nazi and you saw that video. Like this guy is objectively not a Nazi. Um, He's, he is a, conservative in the most conservative of traditional senses the guy is not a nazi and that they still trot out oh he's far right he's a neo-nazi and they like you go to the website like you go to the upf website and you can see right there he wants lower taxes less welfare the only thing that i sort of like disagree with there is trade policies and he wants like solar panels to like people to build solar panels and he's a bit into the greeny green kind of stuff but it's not I mean, the economic stuff, like the low taxes, really you can, they really stand out. The cutting of welfare, the cutting of taxes, the cutting of red tape. Like these are right of centre political policies, like genuine conservative policies. And this guy gets called a far-right Nazi. He just laughs at him. You should follow his Twitter account. He just sits there laughing at him going, oh, this is ridiculous. Like, <laughs> And it's obvious to anyone who pays attention how stupid the media are when they talk about people like him. Yeah, another great example of that just this week was the uh, Jordan Peterson interview on British television. Um, how oh, that was amazing! The interviewer. It's it's like she had never heard these responses before, and didn't know how to deal with them, and so then tried to rephrase what he just said to make it sound bad. <laughs> Did you see the meme that I made? Ah, Did no, you see the meme that I made? I uh, I said like it was Jordan Peterson. Do you know the Sydney Swans are the best team in football? And she responds. So you hate football? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think it was actually, I think it was actually really profound what happened. And it's had, I think it had 3 million views when I um, had caught up to it, but it's been re-syndicated and reposted. So this thing has had a huge, huge cultural influence. And the fact that he's a Harvard professor and a clinical psychologist, 
it's you know this isn't Milo who's who they can just say is just a troll. But this guy yeah. is you know a very serious academic and intellectual. And believe me, most academics are not intellectuals. Trust me. Uh, and so, so for him to do that, what what happened was when I was watching it, I couldn't help but think this has turned into a therapy session, and she's crazy. Like he's just showing her because this is what a good psychologist does. They put you in a position where you show yourself that you're crazy, and he did to her, and it was just amazing because she was saying what the left always say to all of us all the time. She was gaslighting him, misrepresenting his views, trying to make him feel outgrouped, which is a thing the left does all the time. Uh, if, you, if anyone's interested, um, look up RK theory on anonymous conservative and what he has to say about this. It's quite amazing. Uh, and Ann Coulter talks about it as well. The left is a mentality which it's it's a collective mindset, and so they don't they can't make sense of their worldview individually. But they only when they all come together in a mob, they feel like they've got an identity that's coherent, and then they can achieve something. They feel powerful, and so. She was trying to make him feel like he's excluded from respectable society and she represents, the, you know, the normal people, the sane people. And he just flipped it around every time and, and she just looked so hysterical and so, so nuts. And so he did to her what she was trying to do to him just so masterfully and it just looks so effortless. I, I really think that's another one of these big moments. We will look back and say, you know, everything was kind of different after that. Yeah, it'll be. It's a bit like the the James the Ball getting fired from Google, and there's been quite a few. You know, there's been quite a few uh, cultural turning points like that. And it's interesting because there's been so much spoken about that, and they tried to play the victim, the victim of him, and then someone turned around and said, "Well, actually, Jordan Peterson has has had more abuse than than she has." Uh, I, I think it's it really shined a light on how weak their arguments are and the fact that she's a journalist like this is a journalist this is channel 4's top interviewing journalist and she had clearly not done her research like she, the, the the questions she was asking him and the answers that, that he was giving are just quintessential to a T Jordan Peterson that I mean it was great hearing them there were all these answers that that I, a lot of the answers to the questions were answers that I'd heard before but yeah like the entertainment and what was so engaging about it was just how easily he turned the tables on her and like saying looked her right in the eyes and said no that's bull crap that's not what I said and it's like the it's like you know when when a lefty or when a media goes oh well are you a racist and you're like Whenever someone asks me I'm a racist, I'm, I'm like, are you an idiot? Like, it's a stop asking loaded questions and or they make a statement. And I'm like, that's not what I said. Like, I didn't I, I didn't say that. And he's just st rather than giving into her frame, it's all about that frame balance. And rather than him giving him to her frame, she's in ultimately given into his frame. And you can actually see it sort of by the end where she's like a little bit giggly and, and she's like, oh, you, you know, you can you can see it's it's classical. It actually ends, it actually ends up being a little bit more feminine by the end of it, and it's like, hold oh, a second, she's just basically accepted him as the alpha male, and all of us, and it's obvious to everyone. Without you can't, most people wouldn't be able to articulate it. But if you go back and look at it, you, you'll see it that where she thinks she's in charge, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, wait a minute, I'm like a, you know, I'm like a, a B grader, you know, at my local club, and I've just stepped out into the Premier League and I don't know what I'm doing um, and I thought I was good, but now I'm not and now I've just been found out. Oh, crap. And I think, I don't know what she, I don't think she's come out with any statements yet. I think everything's come from Channel 4, but I would it would be good for her to come out and say, look, I don't think I'm a victim. I, I respect Jordan Peterson. And I think she did come out and say viva la free speech and all that kind of stuff, which which I think was good. I don't I don't dislike Kathy Newman after that. Like I, My problem is more with the general, the media at large and the way Channel 4 handled it. But I don't. Uh, I, I didn't come out thinking at, thinking less of Kathy Newman than I otherwise would have for her being a left wing journalist. Yeah, David, you were going to say. Oh, I loved the moment when she asked him, "What gives you the right to say, yada yada?" And he just said, "I'm a clinical psychologist." <laughs> 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 as, as Stephen Mullen, you pointed out, it's not an argument, but it was just that moment where he asserted his dominance and he exactly. Said, yeah. I'm in charge here. Okay, so um, I what I find often when I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. No, no, you finish what you're saying and then I'll, I'll, I want to, there's a few more comments that we should sort of go through and someone's asked ask the question as well. Yeah, so. sure, sure. 
Uh, uh, yeah, just whenever I like listen to Jordan Peterson talk about a subject, it's like he gets in so deep that um, my body actually gets physically warm. I actually go into a different mental state. Um, he has that effect on a lot of people. It's, he really makes you think and he really makes you look at yourself. Um, and I think he did that to Kathy Newman. Yeah, yeah, he did. He did really well. He did. He did really well. Yeah. Um, I'll have to watch the Check it out, mate. So, okay, so just a couple of quick <laughs> comments. So, Ash Taylor said it helps to have uh, Ben S and Jordan P on our side. Oh, I'm not sure who who's, who's Ben S. Oh, ben Shapiro, I imagine. Oh, Ben Shapiro. Yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. It does. I mean, Ben Shapiro. I think. I like Ben Shapiro. He's a little bit cookie cutter for me. I prefer Stephen Crowder, yeah. who's way more edgy. But ben, I like I like Ben Shapiro. Ben Shapiro answers questions really well. He's really good in debates, and that's what where he's good. Um, Ian said, after working in Asian countries, I can tell you that the countries that were settled or colonized by British tend to have the most livable. It tend to be the most livable even after independence, with the exception of India. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's true. So you see places like Hong Kong, Singapore, all these Asian countries that had that real Western influence and that real English, especially English influence, um, ha have done a lot a lot better. I mean, and you got Japan and Korea who have the American influence, which is similar but not quite. But like Hong Kong, especially, which were, was a British colony, and I think Singapore was was to a lesser extent, and you got Macau as well. These places have you know, these these are economic marvels of South Asia and then you got the rest of Asia, which is like taken three decades of communism to sort of turn around and say, wait a minute, maybe capitalism's a better idea. Um, Killer AD said, give them an inch and they will take a mile. Yes, they definitely will. Um, and in the, sorry, Ian, you've said a few things, so I'll answer your question in a minute. Uh, mod, 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 I can't, sorry, I can't pronounce your name. It's something. When it comes to Twitter comments, it's possible they could do it through some form of keyword analysis, but it would be taxing on the server resources. It seems more likely based on upvotes. Uh, yeah, look, I think that's true when you're talking about um, co like threads that are sort of three, 400 comments long, like 100 comments long. The ones I was looking at today were 20 to 30 comments long. So you can just click view all comments and you'll see every comment there. Uh, and then the question is here. Okay. They have you, definitely you, done it to Trump. Like, they have definitely done it to Trump. When you look at Trump... Oh, yeah, I know that. You, you scroll down, you'll see tens and tens. You won't see any positive ones. So I, I do, they, their AI is pretty sophisticated. But anyway, that was a good point that um, that was made there. Yeah, and so Ian, Ian said, ask the question. Do you think... So maybe I'll ask uh, David Hilton this question. I can answer it as well, but you, you, you answer this question. Um... Sorry, Ian's just said Macau is Portuguese but heavily influenced by Hong Kong. So that's that's. Thank you for telling us that. That's interesting. Uh, Ian said also said, do you think that the left will be able to bring down Jordan B. Peterson, remembering they have no morals? Uh, yeah, I think they try. Um, there was someone I was I was listening to recently. Uh, one of the YouTubers I, I can't remember because I've caught up with um, a few uh, about this interview, and uh, they were making some really good points. I was Milo actually. Um, he, he laid out a roadmap of what's ahead for Jordan Peterson. So what they're going to do now, and I think, um, I think he might, and I experienced it myself to some degree with the way um, I was treated by, um, by uh, the fringe left and Antifa blogs and things like that. Um, they now have to destroy his image because he's shown them up so much. He's now humiliated them to such an extent that it's not a Kathy Newman, if that's her name anymore. It's not about that. This is now about the entire, uh, the credibility of the leftist establishment. So they are going to um, go after him as hard as they can. So um, I, I'd be very surprised if he gets another mainstream gig, mainstream media gig. Um, they're already trying the uh, approach where they've, they're saying she had to call in a security company. And uh, well, been, oh, they always play the victim, you know, always. It's, it's, it's always like that. So um, they're, they're going to now um, write up articles where they'll talk about his troll army. Uh, the talk because he's very mild you're not going to be able to catch him out but they're definitely going to go through as much of his dirty laundry and try and um, discredit and humiliate him and uh, and but i think that they've met their match i think this man is incredibly psychologically resilient i think he's got a huge fan base and he's nowhere near nazi he's just that's not going to stick so i think 
they they may have yet another uh, Milo type situation where they're going to go after him really hard. They're going to try and destroy him, and instead, it's going to blow back on them and discredit them even further. I, I, I think that's what's probably going to happen with this one. I I tend to agree. I I think it's it's the I, I mean it's the age old saying if you if you want to sh- shoot for the king, you better not miss. And they've shot for the king, and they with a cannon and. M- still managed to miss and sort of somehow it's ricocheted back and blown up their own, their, their own building. So I, I don't think they, they can try all their like there. There's nothing they can do. Like Jordan, Jordan Peterson, like he's, he's arguably the smartest individual on the planet right now. I would, I would be surprised if there was anyone who, um, who was a, was a capable of articulating reality and, and articulating the things that he articulates and, and describing the way the world is right now better than he could. I mean, if, if there is someone out there who thinks they're better than him, then I would love to hear them speak. But I don't, I, what you say that you think the left's mesh, met their match. I think the left has met their conqueror. They, this guy is in, unbelievably intelligent. Like he, I've, I've, I haven't seen all of his stuff, but I, you know, I've gone about, Get two thirds of the way through maps of meaning. Uh, they're long lectures, so it's, it takes time to get through them. But he's brilliant. Like this guy is. This guy can take a story. He st- takes these just Disney stories, you know, basic Disney stories, and goes, "This is what it means for you. This is this. This is what this story means to you." And because these stories resonate with us so much, and he's able to articulate how they do that, that kind of thing. Like that's he's able to take politics pop culture and normal culture and just be like, there you go. This is it. And this is how it relates to you. And this is why it matters to you. And th- there's a reason the guy, I think he's get his Patreon gives him, get, gets him $50,000 a month in donations. Um, I, I'd, I'd argue he probably deserves more, but I mean, $50,000 a month in crowdfunding is, is significant. They're not going to shut him down. The guys, the guy is, is here. He's here to stay. Um, and I think, you know, if we if if we do end up having other lives, we'll be hearing about this man for for centuries, if not millennia, um, provided we don't kill ourselves and, and destroy all the all the information in the in the time being. Also, I, he doesn't care. Like they can do whatever. Sorry, I should I, I should just say something. Someone just noted that Jordan Jordan Peterson is very open about his past. So they're like, what are they going to do? And he tells the truth, and yeah. he'll um, what yeah. you know how did you know. How do you how do you beat how do you beat that the someone who always tells the truth and people love him like you just what are they gonna do what are they what what are they gonna do like some somehow smear him he'll just turn around and say oh, that's not true and if he comes out and says that's not true then ninety percent of people are gonna say well if he says it's not true then, then it's probably not true unless they can find like additional evidence to to back up any kind of claim. But if he, if someone makes an accusation against him and he says, no, that's not, that's completely untrue and then fires back at him, then it's like, you know, they've basically, they've basically, the uh, he's a creation of the left as well. The left created Jordan Peterson. Like he wouldn't happen if the left weren't so militant. So he's come out, they've created, they've created their own destruction um, in him. I mean, oh, he's not the only person. Like there's obviously a lot of people behind him. Like you got all these online personalities, like, you know, you also got Stephen Crowder, Ben Shapiro, um, Sargon of a Cad, even guys like Bering who does like meme videos that, which are hilarious. He, you know, we've got all these different angles and I, I just don't, uh, this with Jordan Peterson and all these other guys, I don't see how they can stop the momentum without violence, which I, I, I just, I mean, it could happen, but I, I, I think right now it's unlikely given how many people's eyes have been open to, to the truth. And I, I think so. Um, like he's a, he always draws upon Jungian semiotics, like this sort of this field which had become really moribund, but um, talked a lot about the collective unconscious and those, those sorts of things. Like what are the big symbols that um, our, our uh, me- memories or our cultures operate on? And, and it had sort of died off because post, postmodernism isn't anything like that. But he took this, this entire field which had sort of died off and, like, has revitalised it. Like, so few people do anything like that. And not only 
has he revitalized an entire field of inquiry? He's like brought it into people's living rooms through YouTube. Um, it's just an astonishing accomplishment what he's done. Um, so yeah, the, I, I don't. I, I wonder if the left now will be so scared of him they won't take him on in debates and. Um, yeah, they might just run away every time he enters the room because uh, he's he's been a Harvard professor. There's no argument going to say to him that he hasn't heard, thought about, and probably come up with a rebuttal to. Uh, David, what were you going to say? Oh, well, his whole life has been based on truth. Uh, I've got through the introduction of Maps of Meaning, and he tells a story about how he reached a point in his life where whenever he was saying something, there would be a voice in his head, if he didn't believe what he said he was saying, the voice in his head would say, you don't believe that, that's not true, and he would have to shut up. And he had to make himself obey that voice in his head. So he had to make himself say what he believed was the truth. So you can't bring somebody down like that. Yeah, and he's not doing this for uh, some agenda. Like, you know, he's, he's not doing it for 50K a month on, on Patreon or, or, um, or more YouTube followers. And unfortunately... There are a lot of a lot of people in this old sort of media sphere who who you can tell you know they're they're doing it for some um, ulterior motive. Now that's fine. People have to eat. You know that that's fine. But he's he's not doing it for that at all. He just he just believes that something is true, and the whole world is trying to shut him up. And he's saying no, it's it's just not going to happen. So there's a purity. Um, that's the way those types of people do change the world. Uh, it's a Jonah Bark character you know that uh and the left like to talk about martin luther king and rosa parks as those sorts of figures but they were not that those people had massive flaws actually when you dig down as in the communists well gandhi was a pedophile um mlk is a he was into orgies he was communist. a drunkard <laughs> yeah exactly you know um but peterson is the real deal of that type of person who changes the world i think mm. well also also one of the things that i'm sure absolutely uh, petrifies the left is the fact that he's openly Christian or in, if not Christian, he's still religious and he's religious in a certain sense and has op already said, yes, the Christians got it right. And a lot of what he says in his talks where he goes through and, you know, the map, the Bible style, like the Bible series, which I, I'm going to get to eventually where he goes through and discusses, all right, this story means this in the Bible, this story means that. And it's like, it's amazing the way that he, okay, you know, when I was a kid, people always said, oh, well, you got to take it literally, the Bible literally, you know, but it, what it really means is you should take the Bible literally in the sense that it's literacy. So you analyze a Bible story the way you would analyze a, a Shakespearean story and, and what does it mean in that? And the Bible really does discuss the, like how humans, like it, it really describes the human dilemma and what we're doing and what we are so so obviously it's not perfect but so 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 well and one of the things that he, in a recent talk that i saw him talk about with the old testament and i'd love to go through and do my own research for this i'm maybe someone who knows more about it can answer but the story of the old testament in the bible is essentially People, you know, there's the story of Israel and Israel tries to find the promised land and then they find the promised land and it's good and then they try and build the perfect state and then the state collapses and then they get dispersed and then they come back and they try and build the perfect state again and then the state collapses. And then it keep, and this, this happens over and over and over again until Jesus comes along and says, the state's not the answer, the individual is the answer. And that's the message of the Bible. And he said that in a talk, I think it was on Joe Rogan's podcast. I just watched a clip of it. And it's just blown my mind. It's like, holy moly, that's, he's right. Like that's, that's the, the Bible is basically um, telling people that government is not the answer. The individual is the answer. That's, you know, you sacrifice, you make the individual sacrosanct and only the individual can solve their own problems. And I it's have a just. counter to that actually. Um, yeah. the, the way I see, like, cause yeah, like Israel goes through this cycle where it's strong and then the enemies are able to come in and take it over and then it's strong again and it goes through these cycles and uh, all through like judges and kings like it talks about how um like whenever they had a good uh ruler who obeyed god and um you know like uh, 
supported the supported the church and like um didn't and smashed all the idols and all that sort of stuff then is israel was strong and god protected israel from its enemies and whenever it, israel had a king who um was evil and uh, worshiped idols and uh, did all that sort of stuff um that's when israel got taken over so that could be a counter way of seeing i think no, he acknowledges he acknowledges all the things that you've just said you should probably go okay go, go and check out the thing and, and maybe listen to what he said and then respond Absolutely. to that i think i think you're sort of both on the same page regardless yeah. okay so we just we have i mean we, we, we sort of haven't got much more time here maybe a little bit longer but there is one venom eagle has just um sort of made, given us one more maybe we can answer one more question here um also i just wanted to point out that killer killer 3000 ad just said that there's only one ticket left for jordan's show in melbourne it sold out quickly i didn't even know there was a show uh, hopefully oh, he makes another one and i can go we, <laughs> you got a ticket wow yeah. lucky you. i didn't even i didn't even hear about it so how annoying but yeah i mean we can talk about this uh yeah. another time we would have been good to go and vlog that one as well hey yeah. um so Venom Eagler said, any thoughts on the phenomenon of young men checking out of society, avoiding marriage, and even keeping interactions with women to a bare minimum? What does this mean for children and families? Now, I'd like to answer this question, but I'll let's uh, maybe hear, maybe David Hiscox, you want to start, start on this one? Hmm. Or actually, David, actually, David Hilton, you've, 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 you're married, aren't you? Maybe you want to answer this question or who, either one of you. I'm married. So uh, what's the question again? So any thoughts on the phenomenon of young men checking out of society, avoiding marriage and even keeping interactions with women to a bare minimum? What does this mean for children and families? Thoroughly understandable, isn't it? That's our sort of, uh, sort of phenomenon. Look, um, yeah, I, I, um, I do feel very sorry for young men because it's even worse than it was when I was a young guy. Um, our, this is my view. I'm a Christian. So, um, you know, that sort of frames the way I think about these things. Uh, our, our women have been completely corrupted and destroyed by uh, a culture that um, actively promotes um, yeah, female supremacism and just you know, decadence, the abuse of female power. So, and, and it's horrible because what it's doing to people is so awful because um, for women up until 30, um, when it, if I, I can't imagine dating or uh, courting a, a girl unless you know she was some trad Christian girl who you know I found at church or something. I just can't imagine the sort of normal mainstream Australian girl even trying to negotiate uh, how you might build a life with that type of person because they're so entitled and just they themselves have been given this very puffed up feeling of power and a very, very negative and uh, damaging view of men, that that toxic view of men which has been pumped into them. Like I, I remember I was uh, I taught at an all-girls school um, in Brisbane, a pretty prestigious all-girls school for a year, and um, I was I had a head of department there. And uh, I remember looking up at in the school gym and um, they had four houses, as they usually do, like sports houses. And the, the, the names of the houses had the quality of each house underneath. And they were all like, this is the four of them, I think, was something like strength, courage, determination, agility, right? And I remember looking at them and I went, those aren't female virtues. Like, they're just not. Um, yeah. If, if you female virtues you'd find um, maybe I don't know dexterity grace is something like that but it was it was a real moment where I realized we are propagandizing these girls to to not function right and it's horrible because up until about the age of 30 it really damages and hurts the, the boys who are trying to chase these girls and trying to negotiate somehow with them and then after that it's really really terrible for the women and I know a lot of professional, high-performing women who are post-30 and they're not happy. Um, half of them will tell you that, the other half won't, uh, but, but they're not happy. And I wish, I bet, I, I, I know it actually, a lot of them probably wish they could rewind 15, 20 years and undo probably about 15 or 20 chads and go back to that guy that they knew in their early 20s who was probably a good bloke and just flicked him. You know, you know, we've got Chad down the road. He's gonna, um, gonna show me a good time. Uh, I, I'm sure that a lot of women look back with regret, and so hopefully we'll see a change. But in the meantime, our culture is not working for people. It is damaging and hurting both genders. And um, yeah, so for for young fellas today, especially if you're a nationalist and you do want to meet an Aussie girl and you want to uh, at least meet a white girl and you don't want to travel all the way to Poland, um, I recommend churches. 
there are a lot of hot, nice girls in churches. Don't go for a church that's too liberal, like a Hillsong or something like that, because often they've got a, a carousel count the same as the non-Christian girls. You want a church where there's a bit of that old strictness. Meet the parents. Honestly, fellas, that is that is one way that you could find a decent girl. Uh, that's some dating advice from... Um, <laughs> From, from no, I, I, I tend to agree. Um, I'll just respond to the church thing. I think, I, you know, I've been going to church semi-regularly for the last few months and there are lots of very attractive young girls and they are all looking for a husband. They're looking for a man to, like a husband, they're not looking for a cop carousel. They are looking for a man to marry and that's um, the church. It's a bit like it, it, I go to... Um, I go to Planet Shakers, and it's and it's really, really, it's good. Um, I the guy talks about social justice. The guy talks about social justice, but I don't think he uses it in the same sense that we do. I think they're they're quite they're, they're a little bit more conservative, and it's I've um, yeah I've really I've really found church to be good like that. And yeah, if you do want a, to find um, a really nice girl, then church is a hundred percent. It's the place. To, to go because the girls that go to church are a lot of the time they're, they're quite attractive and a lot of the time they're also most of the time they're really nice and they really just want to find a really nice guy that they can settle down with and this is the kind of girl that you want to look for now Dave I want to answer this question in full after but have, Hiscox do you want to do you want to have a have a go or uh yeah it's I'm still in two minds. Like, well, I'm not really in two minds. Like, I understand exactly where they're coming from. Um, I've always on the side of we've got to fight. And so I'm glad that you guys are saying, look, there are places where you can find good women because there are. Um, and it, it's uh, like at the moment we're advertising a book on XYZ called Enjoy the Decline. It's um, written by Aaron Clary, who has a blog, Captain Capitalism. He's given us uh, he's given us a, a He's given us a flog, actually. So um, thank you very much to Aaron. It's been fantastic. We've had a good spike, thanks to him. Um, and uh, I'm, writing, I'm putting together a book review uh, for Enjoy the Decline. And it's a little difficult. And what makes it difficult is because I understand exactly where it's coming from. But at the same time, I'm like, well, we've got to fight this. Like the whole reason I'm doing the XYZ is because we've got to fight this. Um, I understand exactly where MGTOWs are coming from, um, but we've got to find a way to turn it around. And we've, if that means sort of training women, like to say, look, it's got to be this way. If that means that there's going to be a, a stolen generation of women out there who have just like had yeah that was deliberate yes but, and, and it's it's only a half tongue in cheek as well it's they they've lived this lifestyle which has been set up by 50 years worth of feminism and they've realized that it hasn't made them happy and uh, there's going to be a lot of cat ladies out there um because like the generation of men who are the same age are uh, are going to go no we don't and they're going to go for younger ones who are coming through and maybe are a bit more tra traditional okay so yeah I, I i mean i i agree with with both of you in my own way my solution to the problems of, that mig towers are facing isn't to go into a wank dungeon and never speak to women ever again i think that's a i think that's a poor solution um, it's not a very good long-term solution, and it's a little bit like taking a cricket bat home. You won't, you won't find happiness. You won't find long-term meaning doing that. I think what what really helped me in in that sort of area was, uh, for want of a better word, the the pickup crowd. Um, you know, the PUAs. You know, they got they have sort of a bad reputation because they sort of started out just teaching a lot of tricks and you know this is how you can get into a woman's pants. And a lot of them do tend to teach people teach men tricks and strategies and tactics on how to get a woman into bed but there are also a lot of guys in that sphere uh, a lot of guys called like one guy nick sparks who literally changed my life uh with his speeches and his books um and as well as another guy like dj fuji and a few other few other really really smart guys who came out and just gave me so gave some really good advice uh, on you know not just how to meet girls but how to meet the right kind of girl and how to sort of how to behave as a man more so like you know how you like how to change yourself and i think what all these MGTOW guys need to do is work on themselves figure out okay so women might be treating you badly or whatever i mean okay fair enough it's 
you know, women have been taught, you know, there's maybe a little bit of biology, maybe a little bit of social conditioning. Women are, have been taught wrong, but women also respond to a dominant man. And I mean, dominance, not as in tyrannic, like not tyrannical, but not domineering, but a dominant as in a confident, competent man. Women are hardwired to respond to that kind of guy. So if you're a guy who's MGTOW or you're considering becoming MGTOW, look up guys like Nick Sparks. Go look up the 21 convention uh, and go and have a look at all. There's probably hundreds of hours of speeches and you know, look at Nick Sparks, how to have conversation like a man, read his uh, one of his books. I can't remember what it's called, but it's really, really good. It's about holding space and just holding your own as a, as, as a, as a masculine individual man. Mark Manson's also really good. I haven't heard him speak, but he has some really good books and he's Rather than sort of going around, oh, women, rather than blaming women, don't blame women. It's not, women aren't to blame. I mean, yes, look, there are some some females who are to blame, like individuals, but women are just as much victims of feminis feminism and uh, feminist culture as, as men are. They're probably more so the victim. So have a little bit of compassion and sympathy for them and have a little bit of self-reflection on yourself and sort of look at yourself like, am I the kind of person that I want to be? Do I have confidence? Am I able to have a conversation with a woman and show interest? And if she doesn't show it back, does that, is that, does that hurt my ego too much? Like, yeah, every guy who shows interest in a girl and if she doesn't reciprocate, maybe it does hurt. Like even myself, it, it, it you know, it's a bit of a, ah, oh, that kind of sucks, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't change who I am. And once you go out and you approach enough women and you talk to enough girls and you really build that ability to speak to girls and, and interact on a, on a genuine basis, you'll find that things become a lot easier and you'll be like, you'll all of a sudden, maybe instead of resenting women, you might start seeing the beauty in, in who they are, whether they are, you know, washed on feminists. I mean, there are some women like Clementine Ford who just have no redeeming features at all, no redeeming qualities, but, you know, you, you ignore them. Right? Well, not, not clear. <laughs> not like that. So, yeah, like that, so in, to summarise the answer there, um, look at yourself, work on yourself, become a, a confident, strong guy that women cannot help but but respond to on a deep emotional level and then once you are that guy you lay down the law to the the women that you'll even say this is what i won't accept this is what i will accept this is what i expect from you and if you don't fulfill the rules then you're out the door and you've got to be able to, like don't just think oh well, i'm getting my end off I'm, I'm going to put up with this kind of abuse and then like another issue is like obviously men are going out and you know having these issues with like divorce and kids and all that kind of thing. But this is, again, I think this is also a matter of, like, first of all, laying down the law and, and saying what you expect in, in the person and being that dominant man that women, you know, if you're a dominant man and you're a confident man, most women will not leave you. Like, they won't. They, they'll they be like, shit, I, I, I might never meet a man like this again. This guy's so rare that it's so rare to find a man that's genuinely confident in themselves that I don't want to leave him. I, I, I might end up being alone with my cats. So if you'll have that. Also, go to church where there are women who are looking to find guys to marry and they won't leave you unless you abuse them. Uh, and you know you can go through that church, and if you so if you meet a woman who's regular at church, and you marry a woman who's regular at church, you know you wouldn't really you, you know unless you're really 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 cynical, then you you know maybe you might still laugh at it. Maybe church isn't for you. Maybe Buddhism. Maybe just be miserable for the rest of your life. Who knows? Either way, it's up to you. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I think um, I think that's all we have time for today. It's. Bit of good first ever live stream for us at XYZ Z guys. Maybe I mean we can do it on this channel again, but maybe we can hopefully get the, the technical issues sorted out. Happy to do it on this channel whenever. Um, but obviously we want to be growing XYZ's channel as well. So anything, any last any last thoughts before uh, before we signed off? Uh, no, so um yeah, just um, I think that uh, things are changing uh, about the the left the advanced. But um, it's going to be all hands on deck for the next couple of years if we really want to turn things around and, uh, and stop the steady destruction of the country, which is what's happening. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah and uh, just uh, we've just got to get out there and, like, in our real lives, IRL, um, yes. we've got to push back as well. Um, we're winning the internet. 
well yep. and truly, but we've got to win real life. Um, so think, you've got to be, you, you can't be afraid just to put a few noses out of joint, whether it's family, friends, even at work. Um, we've, we've really got to take back the space. Agreed. Agreed. And also don't be afraid to show your face. Don't be afraid. You yes. know, if you show your face and you show who you are, then, then they, you know, docs, they can't, the, the doxing power is, is, is meaningless. Cause it's like, well, you can dox me, but whatever, mate, I'm not afraid. Don't be afraid to show your face, even on the internet. I know, yeah, we've got the internet, but don't be afraid to show your face, to be, you know, show who you are and let everyone see who you are and say, look, I'm not proud. I'm I'm not proud. I'm not ashamed of what I believe in. I'm not ashamed. There's nothing wrong with what I believe in. I'm out and proud, conservative, libertarian, classical, liberal, free thinking, however you want to label it. All right. Beautiful. So um, on that note, thanks everyone in chat uh, for for joining us. Thanks for all the all the people who watched all the way through. This was just the first live stream. Um, we will be doing more in the future because this was a, a whole lot of fun. Uh, David Hiscox, David Hilton, thanks for joining me on my channel. And uh, yeah, we'll we'll see everyone around. See you thanks later, so much, mate.